Welcome to the 700 Club. Today is Good Friday, and it's the day we remember the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We call it good because the death of Jesus accomplished our redemption, and it fulfilled God's plan and the prophecy to reconcile all the world to himself. Still, doubters wonder if the Messiah is real and the Bible true. Recently, Paul Strand spoke with, spoke with two men who have spent decades compiling the proof. Alex McFarland is a leading Christian apologist. If you're wondering, that doesn't mean he apologizes for the faith. It means he defends Christ's history and shows why you can trust it. To get there, he first explains what historians want. They want eyewitness testimony. They want multiple testimony. They, they want early testimony, and the fourth is hostile testimony. As for eyewitness and early, the Gospels Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are by men who either knew Jesus in the flesh or got their facts from eyewitnesses, like Mary, the mother of Jesus, and others. Paul's epistles are written by a man who encountered the resurrected Christ. We have got the Gospels coming to us from less than 10 years after the cross. Compare that to the 643 ancient copies of Homer's Iliad, whose authenticity scholars don't question. But from the time of the writing to the copies we have, more than 500 years, in fact, around 900 years. We've got the Annals of Caesar, which comes to us in several dozen copies. But again, from the earliest copies we have, the time of writing, nearly a millennia, a thousand years. Compare that to the main facts about Christ. The core of Jesus' identity message credentials was in circulation regularly within eight weeks after the cross. As for hostile testimony, or at least not pro-Christian, many outside sources wrote of this Jesus. A worker of wonders did miracles, claimed to be God, crucified at Passover, the core facts of the gospel, death, deity, and resurrection, just based on ancient Jewish, Greek, and Roman sources that certainly were no friend to the burgeoning church. That's very compelling to historians because it represents objectivity, that those no friend of the movement also corroborate the core facts of what we know about Jesus. Will Durant, an atheist most of his life, but possibly the world's most trusted historian, testified this. The four Gospels are absolutely trustworthy from an historical standpoint. Durant would say if you reject those. We would also have to reject a hundred other ancient names, the authenticity of which no historian would dream of questioning. Uh, Aristotle, Julius Caesar, people that we don't have as much evidence for as we do for Jesus. Filmmaker Rick Larson finds proof of Christ and the miraculous world around him in a whole different sphere, scientific evidence. There are two great events in Christianity. There's the incarnation and there's the execution and resurrection. That's, those are the two great events. And those two things God chose to use, leave hard evidence that we can find today <laughs> and show that they occurred. In the Star of Bethlehem documentary, Larson found there really was a light in the heavens that guided the wise men to baby Jesus. It was even shown on coins made at the time. The Christquake shows how Larson's crew found in ground, once covered by the Dead Sea, the geologic ripples of the gigantic earthquake that split rocks at the very hour of Jesus' death. It all proves to Larson who God is. The two documentaries show that the star of Bethlehem was real, that's the heavens, and that the quake at the cross was real. So he is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he chose to leave enough evidence for us to see those things are true. The Gospel of Matthew described both the star and quake. And for both the star of Bethlehem and for the quake at the cross, the facts we find, scientific, hard science, hard scientific facts we find are consistent with the record in Matthew. As for the written record, remember those hundreds of ancient copies of Homer's Iliad or the dozens of Caesar's biographies? Well, many more manuscripts of the New Testament exist. Fragments, portions, complete New Testaments, roughly 30,000 copies. And even if we didn't have those? We could reconstruct verbatim the entire New Testament, Matthew through Revelation, just based on more than a half million verse citations by early church leaders that have been discovered. The trustworthy history in the New Testament finally brought the atheist master historian Durant around. It is said that Durant became a Christian before he died because he was compelled by the historicity of Jesus. McFarland's conclusion? A believer does need faith in Christ. But it's a faith validated and worthy 
of our trust, our following, and our obedience. Jesus is real. Jesus is real, and he's proving it every single day. He is still showing up in people's lives. He is still being a savior. He's still able to save us from our sins, heal, of, heal us of our diseases, and be with us for all eternity. This Good Friday, I encourage all Christians everywhere to read Psalm 118. That would have been the last psalm at the Seder service, the Last Supper. And at the conclusion, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. To imagine Jesus singing that as he's awaiting what is to come, and he knows what's to come. He sings that. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He prays, not my will, but your will be done. He knows the cup he's about to drink. He knows the terror, uh, the trauma of what's getting ready to happen to him. And it was more than what the Roman soldiers did. It was more than the rejection, the betrayal. It was more than the mocking. It was taking on the consequence of everyone's sin. Uh, that would be my sin. That would be your sin. To take on the disease of all mankind for all time. To take it. He bore our infirmity. Why did he do that? because he loves us, and it's wonderful. That's why we call it Good Friday. And the history is there, the biblical record is there, the contemporaneous record is there, and the influence throughout the centuries is there. If you want to know about the archaeology that's current, currently happening in Israel, how archaeology is proving the truth of the Bible, the history of the Bible, and it's doing it on a regular basis, We've got something for you. It's called The House of David. This is the latest episode from our CBN Films Written in Stone series. It shares the archaeological evidence behind Israel's greatest king, King David. And uh, Jesus was known as the son of David, uh, the prophecy that from David's line would come a king for Israel for all time. Now, it's yours for a gift of any dollar amount, and the reason we're asking for funds is we need production money for our new series coming up on the oracles of God, how we got the Bible. So for a gift of any dollar amount, you can get exclusive access to House of David with instant streaming in 4K on the CBN Family app. You'll also get a copy of the House of David DVD. We'll send that to you. Uh, all you have to do to get it is visit cbn.com slash written in stone. You can call us and say, I would like to get House of David. Uh, call us with your gift of any dollar amount, 1-800-700-7000. Or you can text King David, it's all one word, to 51555. Do it now, 1-800-700-7000. Welcome back to 700 Club for CBN News. It's looking like Easter 2021 could be much different from last year. As more people get vaccinated, church leaders hope to safely reopen for Resurrection Sunday. CBN Charlene Aaron has the story. In 2020, many churches closed doors and moved to virtual services as COVID-19 forced churchgoers to celebrate Easter through computer screens and mobile phones. This year, with more Americans getting the vaccine, a growing number want to return to worshiping together. We're doing a lot of services to accommodate all of the space um, and, still, and still doing all of the spacing and the masking that's being asked and required um, to make sure that it's a safe experience, but yet, yet people still can worship the Lord together. In California, however, there are still restrictions, and one pastor is pleading with Governor Gavin Newsom to fully reopen churches ahead of Easter Sunday. Several churches sued over extreme restrictions banning in-person services. Then the Supreme Court stepped in to offer some relief. In a video, Pastor Jack Treber of Santa Clara's North Valley Baptist Church says enough is enough. We have a 3,000-seat auditorium that sits empty. Governor Newsom, I implore you to open up our churches by Easter Sunday, April the 4th. We've been obeying for 366 days, one year and one day. We have had 
zero deaths in our church of thousands of people. We've had zero hospitalizations. Thanks to the rollout of the COVID vaccine, Americans are ready to head back to church. According to a Pew Research study, roughly four in 10 plan to attend Easter services in person this year. Most people who are comfortable with coming back have come back and we're expecting as the numbers have continually gone down and people um, are getting vaccinated, people are more comfortable. Uh, we're expecting people to start coming back. Not everyone agrees. Pastor Siobhan Smith and her husband lead New Generation Church in Berlin, New Jersey. Like most congregations, they took their services online when the pandemic hit, then moved back inside with a 25 percent capacity and other safety precautions. When New Jersey lifted restrictions, the church hosted an anniversary celebration, a move Pastor Smith now regrets. Church was full. Following the service on Sunday, we're starting to feel, you know, uh, feeling a little flu symptoms. You know, some coughing, some got headaches, some have fever. My son tested positive. My husband tested positive. My daughter tested positive. Every day, we're still getting reports, tested positive. The musician tested positive. One of the praise and worship leaders tested positive. For that reason, Pastor Smith says their planned Easter service is on hold. Now, since this has happened, um, you know, with me and my husband dialoguing, I think we're going to have to have a virtual Resurrection Sunday service. Our viewership online has skyrocketed. Um, and, and that's been the case for most churches. And so we've, we've really put a lot of effort into making sure that we have a good online experience. We've really done everything that we can to meet people and disciple people where they are and where they feel comfortable, to be honest. Still, whether in person or online, those we talked with agree that sharing the message of Easter is what's most important. Yes, there is a big emphasis on Easter, um, but we're not just after the regular people who have been coming, coming back. We're after the people who don't know him to come in and experience him. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. There are signs we're not yet out of the woods of the COVID crisis. New cases up 17 percent over the past two weeks, putting a damper on baseball's opening day Thursday. The Washington Nationals and New York Mets postponing their season opener after a player tested positive. In New York, though, the ballpark opened to 25 percent capacity with temperature checks and proof of vaccination. Meanwhile, Pfizer announcing its vaccine remains 91 percent effective after six months. A late season cold snap bringing potential record cold temperatures to the southeast today. People waking up to temperatures in the upper 20s in some areas and a hard freeze expected in some states overnight. Temps will dip into the 20s and low 30s in Alabama and Georgia, all the way up to Tennessee, the Carolinas and much of Virginia. Parts of the region haven't felt cold so late in the year for more than 100 years. Dan Venezia is a tough guy, but this personal trainer was no match for COVID-19. Dan was hospitalized with the virus last year on Palm Sunday. So what happened to him in the hospital that led to an Easter miracle? You're about to find out. I battled sicknesses in the past, but nothing like this invisible enemy, this opponent much greater than any I'd ever faced before. Mid-March 2020, New York City was in a panic. Seemingly overnight, the coronavirus had evolved from a breaking news headline to a citywide crisis. For personal trainer Dan Venezia, it was unlike anything he'd ever seen. My body hurt to the touch. It felt as if I was being, you know, repeatedly tackled by an NFL lineman over and over again. I thought I had given myself a really tough workout, but then it was to the point where I could barely move. In the days that followed, other symptoms began to manifest. To keep his wife and two sons safe, Dan quarantined himself and prayed for the best. 11 straight days, I had a fever of 103 degrees, nonstop headache, pounding like a, a sledgehammer in my head, shortness of breath, tightness in my chest. If I tried to take in a deep breath, it was as if I was inhaling broken glass. I'm praying every day that you know, this is not a serious thing and that I can break it and I can beat it. But after nearly two weeks of worsening symptoms, Dan knew what it meant. A COVID test at a nearby urgent care confirmed it. Dan was positive. I said goodbye right here, right at this counter to my wife of 22 years and my two teenage boys, not knowing if I'd return home to them. 
On the morning of Palm Sunday, Dan checked himself into the hospital where doctors diagnosed him with pneumonia. Later that night, his fever spiked to 104 and his O2 levels plummeted below 90. It was the worst night of my life. And this disease, this virus, uh, was greater than any opponent I've ever faced before. It, it knocked me out physically. I wanted to escape. I wanted to rip the IV out of my arm and the oxygen out of my nose. Confined to that hospital bed with no one by his side for support, Dan became overwhelmed. The television was on and it was spewing out the death toll numbers. And uh, they were showing overcrowded funeral homes. They were showing uh, morgues and, and nursing homes. And I was questioning God and I was thinking about not being there uh, to send my boys off to college and not being there for their weddings. And I went in as a man of faith, but I began to question the very existence of God and his will. Then, through the words of the late American nun, Mother Angelica, Dan found the faith to keep fighting. My eyes were closed and I hit the channel up button by mistake. And it was Mother Angelica saying the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer, the words that Jesus taught us. And I prayed alongside with her for 30 minutes or so, giving me that spiritual food that I needed for my soul. And Dan wasn't alone in his prayers. For that same night, more than 5,000 church members from Dan's Cathedral tuned in to a virtual service to pray for his recovery. COVID may have taken over physically and mentally, but it was no match for the power of prayer. I had former teammates sending prayer chains across the country, parents from the high school that my boys attend having prayer sessions. Uh, and when I tell you that I could feel those prayers, uh, I knew there was no doubt that I would beat this disease. The very next day, his fever broke. For Dan, it was evidence of God at work. Jesus Christ was the best doctor that I had, and the best medicine I was given was prayer. I was so set on the mission on getting home to my wife and my boys, and I knew that Jesus was there with me every step of the way. His body quickly recovered and his breathing improved. By that Thursday, just four days after being admitted to the hospital, Dan was cleared for release. And as they wheeled me out, it, I had a pain-free awakening at that moment. It, it was as if God had let out a subtle yet powerful exhale. And I took in a breath for the very first time in two weeks that did not hurt. That Easter Sunday, Dan celebrated the miracle of Jesus' resurrection and the miracle of his healing. It was a very different Easter than any others that I've experienced because this is like getting another another shot at life. COVID had ravaged my body, had taken over my mind, but the one thing I did not let it break was my spirit. Since that Easter, Dan shares a story with anyone in search of hope for healing. More than ever, he is grateful for the life God has given him here on earth and eternally. The first thing I do is take in a deep breath. I'm so blessed, I, I won't say lucky, I am blessed to be able to share my story, this testimony with others in an effort to provide them with hope that there's a God out there that genuinely cares, a powerful God that lends his hand healing and restoring. Uh, it's the greatest love story ever told. The fact that Jesus rose for you and for me so that we shall not perish but have eternal life, that just warms my soul. It was a special Easter. A resurrection Easter for Dan, really, <laughs> and it should be for all of us. But there are special moments in time where God just touches people in a unique way. And Dan certainly had one of those experiences. But it happens all the time with our God because he's a healer. So here is another answer to prayer. For many months, Jerry, who lives in Seebeck, Washington, suffered from debilitating knee pain. If he tried to exercise, it was agonizing. While he was watching the 700 Club, Jerry heard you, Gordon, say, there is someone. You're laying hands on both knees. There's tremendous pain in both knees. All of the pain is dissipating away. All of the cartilage and cushioning in the knee is being restored. There will be full and complete function from this moment forward. Jerry believed and was instantly healed. He can now exercise. He has no 
pain. Hallelujah. Miraculous. Hey, Thank you. That's Lord. a miracle. That is a miracle. Here's Isabel from Puerto Rico. Uh, a few months ago, she started feeling a strange pain in her face, eyes and nose. She was watching the 700 Club. Terry, you said, I don't know if you have cancer underneath the tissue on your face. It has the potential to be so deforming, not to mention the severity of the cancer itself. God healed you healed that for you right now. Whatever the diagnosis, you've been made whole, you've been healed today. Well, when Isabel heard these words describing her condition, she believed and was healed immediately. Isn't that incredible? When you hear the word describing the condition, you're healed. Here's a word for you. It's from Psalm 103. He forgives all your iniquities and he heals all your diseases. On this Good Friday, let's believe that. Let's believe in the sacrifice that Jesus made. Let's believe in the blood of a risen Savior, and that blood will never lose its power. It still speaks today. What does it speak? Well, it speaks into the very heavens. I have forgiven all their iniquity. I have healed all their diseases. It is finished. The price has been paid. The redemption has been made. The new covenant in his blood. All we have to do, and it's, a, it's all we have to do, all the heavy work has already been done. All we have to do is believe. Isn't that wonderful? Believe. Believe that you don't have to get cleaned up first. Believe that you don't have to go to church every single day for years on end for God to have you and, and have some kind of respect for you. And He loves you. He loves you right where you are, just as you are. And He loves you so much, He doesn't want to leave you there. He wants you with Him for all eternity. So think about heaven. Here's a great thought. In heaven, is there anybody sick? Is there anybody in need of forgiveness? Is there anybody that needs to be reconciled? Answer is no. And then Jesus' commandment to pray. Pray this way. Pray that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's do that right now. Let's believe it. Let's pray for it. And then here's another part. Let's command it with the authority that he's given us, you and me, as believers. For when two or more touch anything, believing, it shall be done by our Father in heaven. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you. And Lord, if anyone is sick, is anyone is infirm, we declare over them that you heal all our disease. We declare that you have carried away our infirmity, that you have carried away our pain. You have done everything needed for us to be of sound body and sound mind. And if there's anyone who's suffering with guilt and shame, rejection, Lord, we speak over them that you forgive all their iniquity. You carry it away. You keep no record of it. You forget it. You separate it from us as far as the east is from the west. We receive it now. We receive all the benefits of the new covenant. We believe in your sacrifice. We believe in your resurrection. So stretch forth your hand now to heal, to restore, to bring righteousness, peace, and joy in your spirit. Give us these things, Lord God, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Terry, God's given you some. Yeah, there's someone, you, you've been in a fire of some kind. I don't know that it was very large, but you've burned your hands oddly on the very tips of your fingers, but so painful. 
God is healing that for you right now. All, everything restored, everything damaged, restored in Jesus' name. And someone else, you have a condition where your, your glands, your, um, in your neck have been very, very swollen. You've almost been too afraid to go to a doctor. You're so afraid you're going to get a bad diagnosis. Today, all infection gone in Jesus' name. Those glands are going to go back down to normal. You'll not have it anymore. There's a woman named Sarah, and you suffer with blinding headaches, headaches that force you into dark rooms, headaches that have taken your life away, headaches, headaches where you just want to retreat and be alone in your pain. God sees you right now. He calls you by name, Sarah. Those headaches are leaving you now in Jesus' name. They're never going to return. He's able to instantly recreate everything with your uh, blood vessels in your brain. So none of this will ever recur again. Be healed now. Be restored. Be set free from these. Just lift your hands to him. Start to thank him for what he's doing, what he has already done for you. Receive it now in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for Good Friday. We thank you that you went to the cross and you did it because you loved us. We thank you. While we were yet sinners, you died for us. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your sacrifice. We want to receive everything you have for us. So we believe it now. We receive it now. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you have been touched by God, let us know. Give us your good report. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. And if you need prayer, we're here for you. Even on Good Friday, we're here for you. We want to pray for you. It's our honor, our privilege to pray with you. And we want to stand in faith believing. So if you need prayer, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. Welcome back to 700 Club for this CBN news break. A terrible train accident in Taiwan, leaving dozens dead today. The passenger train carrying nearly 500 people derailed inside a tunnel. Early reports say an unmanned vehicle slipped down a slope and rammed a portion of the train that was outside the tunnel. Rescue workers struggling to get to people stuck inside. At least 48 people died in the accident. More than 150 are injured. Operation Blessing is giving a bright future to a young Honduran girl. Eight-year-old Kimberly began to have blurry vision in her left eye. Her mother took her to a clinic where doctors diagnosed her with a cataract and detached retina. Her single mom couldn't afford the surgery, so Operation Blessing stepped in, arranging for Kimberly to get the surgery she needed at absolutely no cost to her. You can learn more about what Operation Blessing is doing around the world by going to its website. That is ob.org. This Easter season, celebrate our risen Savior with your CBN family. Join us on the CBN Family app for a virtual communion with Pat, special Easter teachings from Gordon, and more Holy Week reflections and services. Bake a springtime favorite with Wendy, and watch Terry share the meaning of Easter with her family. Don't miss this special time of celebration on CBN Family. Well, we want to help make this Easter your most meaningful ever. That's why we've put together special features on the CBN Family app for you and your family to enjoy. You can partake in a virtual communion service with Pat. You can hear special Easter teachings from Gordon. Learn how to make carrot cake with Wendy, and there's much, much more. All you have to do is download the CBN Family app to your smart device, or you can go to cbnfamily.com to enjoy all of these exclusive features as you celebrate the Easter holidays. Well, Octavia grew up in a Muslim family. When she wanted to go to Sunday school with a friend, her mother said yes, even though she had no idea what it was. So what happened at Sunday school that led Octavia to a total life change? Uh, see for yourself. Ten-year-old Octavia knew her family came from a different religious background than most of the kids at school. Most of the students are Hindus and Christians. I was a Muslim. But Octavia grew curious 
when a friend invited her to watch CBN's Superbook with her at church in Indonesia. She asked her mom, Rusripa, if that would be okay. I remember she said, Mom, may I go to Sunday school? I said, it's up to you, even though I had no idea what Sunday school is. Octavia watched Superbook in class for several months. Then one Sunday, she connected with the Easter special episode, He is Risen. That was the day I saw that they crucified Jesus. His hands and feet were nailed to the cross. I was surprised when that happened. He died to take away our sins. Octavia then prayed with the host of the program to become a Christian. I prayed, Lord Jesus, I invite you to come into my heart. I felt peace. She then told her mom and dad about her decision. I told her, if you are going to do it, you have to be serious and committed to do it. She said, okay. So we let her decide. Octavia now reads her Bible, which her teacher gave her, and is praying for her family. She also invited her younger brother, Ronnie, to watch Superbook with her. Mom walks us to Sunday school, but sometimes Dad takes us too. I also pray, Lord Jesus, please come into my heart. Thank you to everyone who brought Superbook to us. Well, as a Superbook Club member, you're part of seeing wonderful transformations like the story you just saw. Here is a family in Indonesia, and a little girl gets invited to go to Sunday school, and in Sunday school, uh, she hears a message. She sees a cartoon about the crucifixion, and she understands it. She understands that it's for her. Why does she do that? Because the Superbook episodes contain the verses of the Bible in the language that people can understand. When Bible characters are talking, they're talking directly out of the Bible. There's a broadcast map. You can see all the different languages that uh, Superbook is currently being broadcast on. Uh, for some of them, like Mandarin, uh, Cantonese, it's available on the internet. But it's being spread around the world. And how is that happening? But because people like you care enough to give, care enough to say, I want to preach the gospel around the world. I want the children of the world to get the stories of the Bible. When they get these stories, they'll understand them. They'll believe in a wonderful Savior, and it will transform their lives. That testimony you just saw is just one of thousands that we've gotten, and our surveys are showing over 100 million viewers of Superbook uh, from the last time we surveyed, which was about a year and a half ago. So all of these things are possible when you become a Superbook Club member. Now, how much is it? It's $25 a month, and every month uh, you'll be part of this, and you'll receive three copies of every new Superbook episode as it's released. So we'll send you three DVDs of the latest uh, episode. Plus, you'll get free internet streaming access to watch the brand new episode on your smartphone, tablet, computer, smart TV, all for a gift of $25 on a credit or debit card. You'll get instant streaming, internet, uh, internet access of seasons one through five, which is, I believe, if my math is right, that's uh, 65 episodes. So join today. We'll send you three copies of our newest episode, Doubting Thomas. As an Easter bonus, you'll also receive two extra DVDs, The Last Supper, He Is Risen. That's a total of five DVDs, free internet streaming access for $25 when you join. So call us, 1-800-700-7000, or go to cbn.com. Join today. Terry? A true miracle. That's how Morgan Elser describes what happened on Good Friday in 2014. She had been asked to create performance art during her church's service. 45 minutes later, Morgan was staring straight into the eyes of Jesus. Morgan Elser is a talented artist and sculptor who loves to combine her creativity with her faith. 
two weeks before Easter. Her pastor asked her to do a piece of performance art during the Good Friday service. He wanted me to paint the head of Christ on canvas. And I said, okay, I'll try. And he sent me a video of a wonderful artist. And I kept trying to paint this head of Christ, you know, my own version of it. And it just wasn't coming at all. After working three days, Morgan never felt comfortable with the results. So she decided she would try a different approach. So I started doing the relief sculpture of the head of Christ. And I didn't like it, but that's all that was coming out of my hands. And I thought, you know, this isn't what I'm supposed to be doing, but I was getting no other inspiration. It was very, very stressful. Morgan continued to pray. But when Good Friday dawned, she still didn't feel settled about her plan for the performance. Then her husband called her upstairs to show her an episode of The 700 Club, where Gil Emilio was sculpting the head of Christ. I kind of just stood there. I was mesmerized. And I told my husband, I said, I'm supposed to sculpt the head of Christ tonight. That evening at the service, Morgan took her place and got to work as the shapeless lump of clay came to life. They were doing a beautiful reading of the crucifixion of Christ. The lights were low and I started sculpting. My hands were working. His face was emerging. And I didn't know anything else that was going on around me. It was just me and Christ. And I started working on his eyes. And it was like he just kind of spoke to me. It's like he came to life. Started crying. And um, I was shaking so badly. It was just so devastating to have him right there in front of me and experience this pain and sorrow that he had suffered for us. Of feeling that closeness and feeling like you could hear him breathe right there laboring. Um, and I needed to put the crown of thorns on him and I didn't want to because I knew it would just cause him more pain. But I knew for this story to be finished, it had to be done. And I took the crown of thorns and I shoved it down on his head. And I told him, I am so sorry. Morgan says there's another reason creating the sculpture was a miraculous experience. It usually takes me six to seven months to create a bust. And this was minutes. This piece coming out of my hands in 45 minutes was a true miracle. Today, the bust is on display in Morgan's studio, and she loves to tell people about her personal experience with Jesus. I think it made Jesus more real to me um, because it was such a personal interaction. And then just realizing that he's still working miracles. I never could have imagined doing the head of Christ. I never could have imagined being so moved. But with a piece of art, following Jesus is an amazing, amazing adventure. He can use just ordinary people to do extraordinary things for his purpose and his glory. In his hands, all things can be accomplished. What an amazing story. What an amazing experience for her. Gordon? Well, on Palm Sunday, 11 years ago, Anne Gromare uttered her last words. She, moments after speaking, she was shot by her boyfriend. Anne was placed on life support by Good Friday. Both her parents sensed that she was asking them to do something extraordinary. What was it? We'll take a look. The doorbell rang and we were shocked to find a deputy sheriff on the other side of the door with a woman who identified herself as a victim's advocate with the Leon County Sheriff's Office. She was the one who told us that Anne had been shot. Kate and Andy Gromare had just returned home from a Palm Sunday service. When they got the news, their 19-year-old daughter, Anne, had suffered a gunshot wound to the head. Anne had spent the day with her longtime boyfriend, Connor. I asked, was Connor with her? And 
It was the deputy sheriff who said that Connor had shot her. I couldn't process why that would have happened. I knew it had to have been an accident. It wasn't until we got to the hospital and the detective told us that there had been an argument. Connor immediately turned himself in. For now, the Gromares could only focus on Anne, who was on life support. Her father, Andy, stayed right at her bedside all night, praying. About two o'clock in the morning, I was standing over her bed and I heard her say, uh, forgive him. And you know, she did not say those actual words, but I felt like she was saying it to me because I knew exactly what she was talking about. She was asking me to forgive Connor. And I said, no, I'm not gonna do it, no way. After about 25 minutes of saying no to her, I finally said, I'll try. But there was no, she never woke up. The next day, the deputy told them what had taken place at Connor's house on Sunday. That's when we found out that they had been having a breakup fight and Connor had intended to get his father's shotgun to kill himself. But when Ann came back into the house, they continued to argue and he ended up pulling the trigger and shooting Ann instead. On Thursday, the trauma surgeon showed the Gromares a CAT scan of Ann's brain, riddled with shotgun pellets. It was then they realized she would have to be taken off life support. As I was sitting there gazing down at her, I saw her transform in the bed, and what I saw was Christ uh, became one with her, uh, not separate, but just as one completely together. I started sobbing, and it was because I realized that Christ was with my daughter, and I realized that it was not Anne asking me to forgive Connor, it was Jesus. And how could I say no to him, who had forgiven me for all my transgressions? While at the hospital, Kate discovered Connor had put her name on his jail visitation list. She went to see him the next morning. It was Good Friday. He immediately started crying and said he was sorry for what had happened. And I gave him the message that Andy had given me, and that was that he loved him and forgave him. And I said, Connor, you know I love you, and I forgive you. And once I said those words, I didn't feel like I have needed to take them back then, and I've never felt like I've needed to take them back since. Kate returned to the hospital and was taken off life support that afternoon. She died on Good Friday, and she died in the three o'clock hour, the same hour that Jesus died on the cross. She is in the arms of Jesus. She is in heaven. She is at peace. Through a voluntary legal process called restorative justice, the Gromares were able to sit in a room with Connor while they shared their grief, and he expressed his remorse for shooting Anne. After that meeting in which Connor revealed details of the two-day argument that preceded Anne's death, they were able to take the first steps toward reconciliation. Forgiveness is my part. Repenting is on the part of the offender, and if you don't have those two pieces, then you don't have reconciliation. Connor was sentenced to 20 years in prison, Andy and Kate visit him regularly and call him weekly. The Gromer's decision to forgive me was the only reason that I ever came to believe in God and believe in Christ. It, there's no other explanation for the forgiveness the Gromer showed me. Normal people do not forgive the man that kills their daughter. Normal people would hate and condemn Normal people would be angry and hold on to that anger and wish me nothing but evil and probably want me killed. Instead, the Gromers decided to respond with forgiveness and respond in love. And that's, that's nothing but the love of God shining through them. In the years since Anne's death in 2010, Kate and Andy have become a spiritual mother and father to the young man who took their daughter's life, nurturing his newfound faith and even attending his baptism all because they were able to forgive. Things that forgiveness has done for me is to keep me from being going to prison with Connor, being locked in the cell of my own hatred and anger and bitterness. One thing that Kate said is that she wants me to live a life that's worth two lives, live a life that not makes up for the life I took, but at least puts good back into the world. I've got to give back, I've got to serve others, I've got to help others. I could not define Connor by that one moment because if I defined Connor by that one moment, then I was defining Anne by that moment as well. And that would make her a murder victim. And she was so much more than that. 
So every year, even though there's a, a date that is the anniversary of her death, Holy Week will always hold that special message for us that even though there is the, the death on the cross on Good Friday, resurrection will follow on Easter Sunday. Today is Good Friday. Another way of looking at the day is it's Forgiveness Day. It's the day where all sin for all people for all time was forgiven. It's the day where Jesus, hanging on a cross, looks down at the people surrounding him, some of them jeering him, all of them participating in his crucifixion. And he says amazing things. He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Here's Connor, he's in an argument. He shoots his girlfriend, I mean, he takes a life. It's a horrible crime. Justice says Connor should never be forgiven. That Connor in one moment in time did something that's unforgivable. Under the Old Testament, Connor would have been taken out and he would have been killed. There was no sacrifice in the temple period for the sin of murder. It is incapable of forgiveness. But here you have an incredible story of forgiveness, an incredible story not just of forgiveness but of reconciliation of participating in his baptism, of coming alongside and mentoring a new Christian in the Christian faith, of being there for him in his time of prison. What does it take to give that kind of forgiveness? Well, it takes the love of Jesus Christ, that while we were yet sinners, while we were all Connors, Christ died for us. He paid the penalty for us. So if you have aught against anyone, these are the words of Jesus, leave whatever you're doing, make it right, give that forgiveness. Even if you don't understand how to do it, just start the process of forgiving and realize the great redemption that can happen for you and for the one you forgive. If you want help with this, we've got something for you. It's called forgiveness. All you have to do is call us. We'd be glad to send it to you free of charge. Here's words from the Gospel of John. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. CBM Films. In the summer of 1864, one of the wealthiest women in England decided to take a trip. Baroness Angela Burdett Coots belonged to one of the world's oldest banking families. She was a philanthropist to whom Charles Dickens dedicated one of his novels, a London socialite whose circle included the royal family. And without realizing it, she was about to introduce the world to the archeology span of the Bible. Holy Land fever swept through Britain, and the Baroness even convinced her friend Vicky to sponsor the new organization. Vicky was none other than Queen Victoria. And in 1867, the Queen sent a team to Jerusalem to excavate the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Temple Mount. Get written in stone, House of David, for a gift of any dollar amount.